few times in English. That's fine. So tonight, uh, Brendan is going to lead the uh, our practices for our, our, our prayers for us. So uh, everybody recite out loud, but turn your microphones off and harmonize with Brendan. All mother sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me, obstructors who harm me, and those who create obstacles on my path to liberation and omniscience. May they experience happiness, be separated from suffering, and swiftly I will establish them in the state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. All mother sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me, obstructors who harm me, and those who create obstacles on my path to liberation and omniscience. May they experience happiness, be separated from suffering, and swiftly I will establish them in the state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. All mother sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me, obstructors who harm me, and those who create obstacles on my path to liberation and omniscience, may they experience happiness, be separated from suffering, and swiftly I will establish them in the state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. The action bodhicitta prayer, bodhicitta prayer. Thus, until I achieve enlightenment, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. Until death, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. From now until this time tomorrow, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. Thus, until I achieve enlightenment, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. Until death, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. From now until this time tomorrow, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. Thus, until I achieve enlightenment, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. Until death, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. From now, until this time tomorrow, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. The Long Refuge Prayer. We take refuge in the kind root and lineage lambdas. We take refuge in the deities of the mandalas of the yidams. We take refuge in all the exalted Buddhas. We take refuge in the perfect Dharma. We take refuge in the excellent order of the Sanghas. We take refuge in all the noble Dakas, Dakinis, and Dharma guardians possessors of the eye of wisdom. We take refuge in the kind root and lineage lamas. We take refuge in the deities of the mandalas of the yidams. We take refuge in all the exalted Buddhas. We take refuge in the perfect Dharma. We take refuge in the excellent order of the Sanghas. We take refuge in all the noble Dakas, Dakinis, and Dharma guardians, possessors of the eye of wisdom. We take refuge in the kind root and lineage lamas. We take refuge in the deities of the mandalas of the yidams. We take refuge in all the exalted Buddhas. We take refuge in the perfect Dharma. We take refuge in the excellent order of the Sanghas. We take refuge in all the noble Dakas, Dakinis, and Dharma guardians, possessors of the eye of wisdom. Taking the Bodhisattva vow. Until I attain the heart of enlightenment, I take refuge in all the Buddhas. I take refuge in the Dharma, and likewise in the assembly of the Bodhisattvas. As the previous Buddhas embraced to the enlightened mind and progressed on the Bodhisattva's path, I too, for the benefit of all sentient beings, give birth to Bodhicitta and apply myself to accomplish the stages of the path. Until I attain the heart of enlightenment, I take refuge in all the Buddhas. I take refuge in the Dharma, and likewise in the assembly of the Bodhisattvas. As the previous Buddhas embraced the enlightened mind and progressed on the Bodhisattva's path, I too, for the benefit of all sentient beings, give birth to Bodhicitta and apply myself to accomplish the stages of the path. Until I attain the heart of enlightenment, I take refuge in all the Buddhas. I take refuge in the Dharma and likewise in the assembly of the Bodhisattvas. As the previous Buddhas embraced the enlightened mind, and progressed on the bodhisattva's path, I too, for the benefit of all sentient beings, give birth to bodhicitta and apply myself to accomplish the stages of the path. The Short Refuge Prayer. 
In the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha most excellent, I take refuge until enlightenment is reached by the merit of generosity and other good deeds. May I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. In the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha most excellent, I take refuge until enlightenment is reached by the merit of generosity and other good deeds. May I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. In the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha most excellent, I take refuge until enlightenment is reached. By the merit of generosity and other good deeds, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. The four immeasurables. May all mother sentient beings, boundless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. May all mother sentient beings, boundless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. May all mother sentient beings, boundless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. What will you do, page 12, please? I will. <clears throat> Sagaramati, Requested Sutra. Likewise, be extinguished. Extinguish all enemies to my purpose. Whatever evil forces are in me, be defeated. Do this so that when I am victorious, all pure radiance melts into me completely purified. Take all this knowledge, food, and drink peacefully. Enjoy it and be satisfied so that all obstacles may be destroyed. Be liberated from all obstacles, all general obstacles. Maras are defeated by this gesture of the Buddha. By reciting this mantra, may all the Maras be purified. As a result, may all the Maras be defeated. Very good, thank you very much. Okay, so... Um... What we are talking about is the uh, 37 practices of the Bodhisattva. So we got through, I think, the first nine. We stopped on 10, is my notes. Um, and the uh, I'm going to screen share this. And I, I sent the uh, text, uh, the PDF, in, on the WhatsApp last week. So if you had a chance to print it or save it to your computer or digital device, uh, it's strongly recommended. If you can print it at some point, it would be great. If you want me to mail it to you, I can print it and mail it to you. I'll be happy to do that. Just let me know. But it's good to have a printed copy and you can take notes on it, etc. So that's always a, a good thing. So these 37 practices of the Bodhisattva were composed by uh, Nolchu Togme Zangpo in the uh, 13th, 14th century. And they have uh, stood the test of time. Let me see, I'm just setting up my screen here so I can see everything. Just one second. There we go. Okay. Does anybody have any questions or comments about anything that we've talked about last week or uh, moving forward? Anything that you'd like to be talking about? Any comments? <clears throat> okay. Okay. So then uh, we'll continue on where I think we left off when was number 10. So this says, when your mothers who have loved you since time without beginning 
are suffering, what use is your own happiness? Therefore, to free limitless living beings, develop the altruistic intention. This is the practice of the bodhisattvas. So our mothers who we've talked about so much, your mothers who, who've loved you since beginningless time, since, so, so we, we were uh, able to practice our loving kindness and our compassion by thinking of our mothers and using the mothers as, as an example of all beings as being our mothers who have loved us from beginningless time. <clears throat> when they are suffering, when our mothers are suffering, how can we be happy? If we know that they're suffering, they're suffering emotionally, they're suffering physically, they're suffering financially, however, however they may be suffering, it would certainly be something that would tug at our hearts and would want us to help them to relieve them of their suffering. So what use is our own happiness if our mothers are suffering? So therefore, to free limitless living beings, develop the altruistic meditation. In other words, to free all other beings who we visualize as our mother. When we say all sentient beings, all mother sentient beings, in the beginning of our prayers, we're thinking of all beings as being our mothers. We don't know that they weren't, so maybe they were. And if we think of all beings being like our mother, it it removes the the space, the divide between us and other beings. We look at all other beings the same as our mother. So therefore, to free these limitless beings, living beings, if we develop this altruistic intention, this is the practice of the bodhisattvas. So in the altruistic motivation prayer that we just read on page one in our prayer book, that's the encapsulation of, of what that means, that even though these beings um, may have want to wish us harm, want to do harm for us in so many different ways, we still have the altruistic motivation to want to be able to help them. And this is a bodhisattva practice. This is part of being a holy enlightened being, a bodhisattva. Number 11, all suffering comes from the wish for your own happiness. Perfect Buddhas are born from the thought to help others. Therefore, exchange your own happiness for the suffering of others. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. So here we're saying all suffering comes from our wish, our selfish wish for our own selfish enjoyment, for our own selfish happiness. All our suffering, if you think about that, contemplate that. That all the things that we want, gain and remember the eight worldly concerns, gain and loss, pleasure and pain, fame and disgrace, um, pra praise and blame, or what else did I miss out on? Pleasure and pl pleasure and pain. All those things are all self-centered. So if we're able to give them up and say, well, I'm not looking at my own happiness, I'm looking at the happiness of all beings. This is what the, um, this it says perfect Buddhas are born from the thought to help others, that I'm not going to be selfish about this, I'm going to help others. And the perfection of doing that is becoming Buddha. And Buddha is the, the highest realization of a human being to help other beings, to not be selfish, to be completely selfless, to be helping other beings all the time. So therefore, exchange your own happiness for the suffering of others. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. So we can say, I will give you my happiness. I will show you all, your ha all the happiness that I have. I will show you that. I will share that with you. And I will help you. I will try and take your suffering and show you how it's transformed so that 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 suffering gets transformed into happiness and that you can do that on your own. So we're willing to do that. We're willing to exchange our happiness for the suffering of others. 
So this is a prime uh, example of a teacher. You know, the teachers have accomplished a lot. And the teachers have accomplished loving kindness. They've accomplished bodhicitta. They've accomplished the joy. And they've, exa- they've accomplished the, the equanimity. But they have compassion for the suffering of other beings. And they, they say, I will show you my compassion by I will spend as much time as I can as much effort as I can to help you to recognize those things that you are suffering from so that you can apply the antidotes. So their compassion comes in the form of time, comes in the form of of effort, comes in the uh, form of, of work that they prepare to do to be able to spend with each one of us to be able to help us. So in that way, we say that they are exchanging their happiness because they could just be kicking back and just enjoying the day. But they say, well, I'm going to prepare myself so that I can help my brothers and sisters who are suffering. So I'm ready to to come to their to their aid. So this is a practice of a bodhisattva. Twelve. Even if someone out of strong desire steals all your wealth or has it stolen, dedicate to him your body, possessions, and your virtue, past, present, and future. This is the practice of the bodhisattvas. So even if somebody comes and they want to steal your possessions, they want to steal your home, they want to steal your car, Whatever it is, if they want to arrange to have it done by somebody else or something, that we need to be willing to be able to say, okay, if that's what you need, take it to be happy. It's not going to harm me in in the fundamental way because I have all this virtue. I am going to dedicate to you my physical body. I am going to dedicate to you all the things that I can do. I'm going to dedicate to you all my possessions and my virtue, which is inexhaustible. And from the past, present, and future, from the three times. So if someone wants to take these things, we should let them not stand in their way, not to be able to um, uh, think that, myself is more important, my possessions are more important than what these other people seem to want. Now, of course, there's a practicality to this. You know, we we just don't want to go giving things away and so on like that willy-nilly. You know, we've worked hard for things and, and, and we, let's assume that we deserve these things. But Maybe there's a way that we can share these things that we have brought together for ourselves, that we can share them with other beings and help them to recognize how it is that they can accumulate these things for themselves. But if it means sharing them and giving them them, you know, temporarily or even forever, if we're going to give it to them, then that's more important. So I hope you understand that it shouldn't be so rigid that we're willing to give everything away. In the sense of being a monastic, in the sense of being a a, um, uh, a holy being, especially in the old country, they would do that. The only thing that they own are the robes that they're wearing and their mendicant's bowl, their, their alms bowl, the bowl that they go collect food in. That's the only thing that they've been given at the time that they were ordained to be able to to become a a monk or a nun. That's what they're giving. Everything else has been given to them by others. So for them to uh, give that to others um, is 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 no big deal. They they are um, developed in their own sense of uh, of who they are, that they don't need those things. They have no attachment to those things. They have no aversion if they have to give those things away, if they want to give those things away. So we need to contemplate that. We need to think about that and think about how much we are holding on to things and how much more we can share with other beings, particularly if it's going to lead to their enlightenment. 
Some people we can give things to all day long, every day, and it's not going to change them one bit. They're going to be selfish. They're going to take this themselves. They may hoard it for themselves. They're not going to share it with other beings and so on. And we have to recognize that too and say, you know, the most important thing that I can give somebody is this knowledge, is this, this Dharma teaching, because this is what can help them to transform themselves by giving somebody food or by giving somebody a car or giving somebody shelter or clothing or money, they may be squandering it as quickly as it was given to them. So we need to recognize that too, that we don't want to, as they say, throw pearls before swine. If I can use that example, you know, pearls before swine means that you can take jewels and throw it to the pigs. And the pigs have no value of what those jewels are. Those jewels just fall into the mud that the pigs are living in. So we can be giving things to people who have no value of what these things are. And in that way, it doesn't help them. It doesn't help us. And it doesn't help other people who we might be able to help. So we have to have a, a practical logical way in the way we look at this. It has to be a realistic way in which we look at this. But the premise is there that we do not want to have attachment. We do not want to have aversion to giving our things up. <clears throat> this is the practice of the Bodhisattva. So number 13, even if someone tries to cut off your head, when you haven't done the slightest thing wrong, out of compassion, take all this misdeeds upon yourself. This is the practice of the Bodhisattva. So even if someone is trying to cut off your head when you haven't done anything wrong, if someone is coming at you and they are maybe just figuratively trying to cut off your head, they're trying to denigrate you in front of others, or they're actually trying to kill you in front of others or, or secretly, if they're trying to do that, that, that we should say, okay, you know, I'm not going to kill you in order to save my own life. Out of compassion, I'm going to take the misdeeds upon myself. I'm going to say, okay, if this person needs to kill me, if this person needs to denigrate me or something like that, I'm not going to let it negatively affect me. Once again, we have to apply some logic here. We have to ap apply some practicality here. The ideal is that we're, we realize that we're not going to be harmed, that we have, we've had many, many lives, we have this life, and then in the future we'll have many more lives. So by taking this particular life is not going to harm us, and as a matter of fact, it may strengthen us because it, it, it solidifies, it strengthens our resolve in knowing that there is this karma and that we are not going to create negative karma for ourselves by being able to um, harm them who's trying to harm us. We're not going to sink to that level. If they need to kill us, okay, all they got is my, my dead body now. You know, but they're not going to get my true nature, my indestructible true nature, my spirituality, because that is indestructible. That doesn't die. That doesn't go away. So we have to contemplate on this. We have to think about this. We have to recognize this. And the more that we engage in this, the more we develop a, a way of being able to um, be confident within ourselves as to what the essence of the meaning is here. And it may also give us the wisdom in which to be able to help somebody who is coming at us with this harmful intent to be able to transform them, to help them rather, to transform themselves, not to do this terrible deed. So this is the practice of the Bodhisattva. The Bodhisattva is not a passive person. 
It is a wise person, a person who knows how to use the Dharma to be able to transform our dualistic nature into the absolute reality, the absolute truth of peace. So we are, so that's what we're learning how to do, to become a bodhisattva, to help us to do that so that we can help other beings. We're not being passive, we're actually being active. Our meditation is not just a, a passive thing. We just don't sit and just think that we're going to stop thinking. It doesn't work that way. We are going to go through the process that we've been talking about of doing these practices, reciting these prayers in order to develop one pointed mindfulness, which all takes this exertion, all takes this effort to do this so that we can have those moments of clarity. And those moments of clarity will be undisturbed by any thoughts that come through us. The thoughts may still come. We can't stop the brain from thinking. We might like to think we can, but we don't. The brain keeps on generating thought after thought after thought. But we can stop our attachment to those thoughts. We can stop our aversion to those thoughts, our being repulsed by those thoughts. So in this way, we say that our, our meditation practice is very active. It's not passive. It is active. It is active to be able to help all beings. The motivation is to help all beings to attain enlightenment. And this is the prime cause for the bodhisattva, to help other beings. Does this make some sense? Anybody have any questions or comments about any of this? Yes, Kate. So it occurs to me with these last couple that they're very hard to realize if you have certain family attachments, like a parent of young children. If you let somebody hurt you seriously or kill you or put you in the hospital, they're not going to have anybody to take care of them. <clears throat> or if you let them take all your stuff, the children will have nothing to eat tonight. So um, yeah, I can see how have the, the karmic ties that we have in this life would seem to have a priority. Yes, well, there's some lot. You got to apply some logic. You got to point apply some practicality to it. You have to apply some wisdom to it. And as I, I was just trying to say, maybe we develop the the way to be able to talk to that person who has those misdeeds in mind to be able to um, to enlighten them that not to do these deeds. Okay. You know, but so um, so I understand your point. And it's a point well taken. You know, what would we do to defend our mothers? We talk about our mothers all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, what would we do to defend our children and our home and so on like that? But recognize also that whatever you do in defense of your home or your mother or your children or whatever is a karma. And if you're taking a life, a life is a is is one of the heinous crimes, and you have to take responsibility for that. There are mitigating circumstances, but you have to still take responsibility for that. And if there's a way to um, talk that person down or to run away or something like that, then maybe that those are the things that we should consider. Those are the things that we should do. Mm -hmm. Does that make so, sense? I mean, the... so karma doesn't work like the law, where in the eyes of the laws of this world, if you kill someone in self defense, that can be totally excused. But karmically, it's still a problematic thing. Yes, that's exactly right. Okay. Thank you.
Yes, thank you. I mean, does that uh, contradict, you know, what you're thinking of morality as? Don't you think that if, if you did harm to somebody who was doing harm to you, that there's still a responsibility you have? Or do you think that that morality evaporates and you don't have a morality to do that? I mean, no, I personally, if, if I try to imagine even defending myself and I'm trying to be non-lethally and it turns out by accident that I killed someone, I think I would feel horrible. Yeah, you would still feel bad about it because you have a sense of virtue. You have a sense of morality. It was a, maybe it was an accident. You really didn't intend to kill that person, but it happened. But you would carry that with you the rest of your life. I mean, does it with with karma motivation? Isn't that a big part of of karma and like intention and motivation, though? Yes. The same act, because I, I couldn't even imagine what a kind of uh, ethic or philosophy of ethics that didn't take like motivation or intent into account in general. But uh, but I know what you're saying like, yeah, that is a part of it. Sure. You know, um, I'm, I'm, you know, I got to use myself as an example, but I remember doing things when I was eight, nine years old to one of my friends in the neighborhood, you know, that now I, I find totally repugnant, terrible, you know, but I did them and it, and it stays with me, you know, and I feel like I've forgiven myself, you know, so many times over this, but still that act that, that, that you know, I did uh, stays with me. Thank goodness it wasn't killing somebody. I, I have an example of what I went through to kind of like leave, leave the person alone. And then their karma got disentangled from me. And then they ended up taking two other people's lives instead of mine and going to prison. And I was set free uh, from the paranoid schizophrenic who bought the AK-57. And I had, was planning to take my life. It, 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 you know, that's when you, you, in my situation, it was my business partner who owned half of my property in California. And once I noticed it, it, he was paranoid schizophrenic and had got the AK-57, I, um, I started thinking about all of my karma, you understand, and, and how to disentangle from the situation and just leave. But not many people have the freedom that I actually had, you know, maybe they, they have a career and need to go to work or, you know, need to continue to live in that spot and to give the welfare of their life or their children. So I was just really lucky in my situation and I had chosen the right path. I feel very good that I didn't do anything to retaliate or to take their life. Um, Sometimes I do feel bad for the people who lost their lives, but I, I am alive today because of the choices I made. That's just an example. And, and with that, do you, is, do you have some sort of sense of responsibility to continue to be virtuous and to, to use that as an example, you know, in order to be able to, to help other beings who, who might fall into that kind of a situation? Yeah, if there's people that have hatred in their hearts and they want to take someone else out, I could be that they fear is going to take their own uh, life. You know, I'd be like, you, you're tightening the knot of your own karma. You can un re, you can take the knot out by changing your entire uh, perspective or location. As it was in my example, I just. I left the whole state of California and went to Arizona and I went to healing, you know, went into, and the karma led, um, led its way for that individual to not be around anymore. Yeah. And I would, I would continue to try to tell people, you know, my example and that this is how I could do it and you can do it too, you know? Right. 
and and sometimes you know um there's something that we might have done wrong to somebody you know years ago in some set of circumstances and some conditions and so on and we regret having to do that uh but that person is gone we can't mm-hmm. find that person anymore you know so but can we have a um 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 uh, can we do something for somebody else in in some kind of a reparation for what we did way back when to somebody that we can't correct that but we try and help somebody else now in a situation that we can so in other yeah. words you know does, does that make sense it does um I think about the two women who lost their life a lot, but I, you know, knowing that their karma is not entangled with mine, I send their family peace and prayers all the time. You know, I even went to the birth city of one of these women in uh, right outside of New Orleans and, um, you know, planted some of my, I make organite and it organite helps transmute negative energies from the, uh, the, from the ground and all that. So. I have my own little meditative sanctuarius uh, releasing of that. Okay, very good. So yeah, so I think that's what, you know, these two particular 12 and 13, one has to do <laughs> with are. possessions, the other one has to do with our very life and, uh, and being able to have a, um, a code uh, in which to be able to, um, to judge, you know, what it is that we are going to do, what our what our morality is going to be. And to be a bodhisattva means not to put ourselves before somebody else, you know, to to uh, to consider the lives of others before we consider our own personal life. OK, thank you for those comments and, and uh, questions. So then we go to the next is 14. Even if someone broadcasts all kinds of unpleasant remarks about you throughout the 3,000 worlds, in return, with a loving mind, speak of his good qualities. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. So now we're talking about somebody who might be slandering you or somebody who might be gossiping about you. Even if someone broadcasts all kinds of unpleasant remarks about you, Throughout the 3,000 worlds, the 3,000 worlds is just this, you know, this number that says that there is this, you know, in our universe, whatever we call it and everything, that there's all these many, many worlds, many, many planets, however you want to describe it. So in return, that we are not going to seek retribution with them. We are not going to slander them that we with a loving mind, with compassion, are going to speak of that being's good qualities. We're going to find a way to express their goodness then 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 cause them harm in other people's views and so on. Uh, in some of these translations, it's talked about that when somebody does something like that, we're going to put them on our head, like our guru. You know, that, that this being who is saying these negative things becomes a great teacher to us because it teaches us moderation. It teaches us tolerance. It teaches us how not to uh, develop um, harmful thoughts and harmful deeds and so on. So, so we're going with a loving mind, speak of their good qualities. This is the practice of a bodhisattva. So I guess in some ways we would say that you know, we're going to take the high road no matter how low somebody else goes. And some people might call that high road a foolish high road. You know, why are you being the fool for that person or something? You know, but we have to we have to be able to evaluate that. We have to be able to to make our own um, judgment of how this balances out in our lives and how it may help other people in their lives. So this is this is the practice of a bodhisattva. A bodhisattva thinks about these things it just doesn't pop up it just doesn't come a bodhisattva prepares oneself for this 
You know, if we're going through all these different um, situations, all these conditions, and we're reviewing these conditions through the transpersonal experience of life, we're meeting people on the streets, we're imagining what they live like, we're seeing what they live like, we're watching films, we're reading books, we're seeing television programs about these stories that some kernel of truth is there about people that live like this. And, and we say to ourselves, my goodness, what would I do in that situation? And this is preparing ourselves for if that eventuality comes. And so what we're preparing ourselves for is to be a bodhisattva, to be a holy enlightened being, to say, I will do what I can to not harm anybody, I will do what I can to enlighten somebody. This is what I will do because this is what a bodhisattva does. <clears throat> the next one would be 15. Though someone may deride and speak bad words about you in public gathering, looking at him as a spiritual teacher, bow to him with respect. This is the practice of the Bodhisattva. So this is very close to uh, 14. This again is the idea that someone is speaking bad about you, and, and but now it's being done in a public arena. Many people are looking at them, but we should look at them as someone who um, is like our teacher, like a guru, like I said before and putting him on, on the crown of our head and being able to say, oh, what a wonderful person this, this person can be or this person has done these things. Find some way to be able to um, neutralize the negativity that is being spewed about by this person saying these bad things. It's also possible in both of these 14 and 15, it's also possible that this person is correct in being able to to see your negativity. In other words, you may have done these things, but their error is going out and, and telling other people about it and gossiping other people about it. That's their error. But you may have to uh, recognize that, oh, yes, this is the truth. I really did do those things. You know, and I have respect for this person who is telling you about this. And it's, it's, it's forcing me more to be able to really consider the negativity that I have done and to correct myself and to thank that person. You know, our greatest teachers are our greatest difficulties. It's very easy to go through life thinking that we've always done the right thing. But when we know that we have done a difficult thing or that we have um that we have difficulty in our lives because of the obstacles that we've created for ourselves the negativities etc those things are those teachable moments that give us cause to change our way of looking at things and the way in which we behave and so on if we didn't have those events taking place we would just go along life thinking that, oh, I can get away with all this negative stuff. I can do these things. So when someone does call attention to it, we should thank them. Oh, thank you for reminding me about this. Thank you for pointing this out to me. Yes, I can do terrible things. I have said terrible things. And not hold it against that person that they've done this. It may not be very pleasant for, for you, and it may not be pleasant for them in the long run because they shouldn't go around telling people about bad things about people like that. But that's, that's on their side. So, but we have to recognize that what's happening on our side here. And then we could say to them, oh, I'm glad that you said these things. I'm sorry that you said it in front of all these people because now you have to carry some of that weight yourself for having done that. And maybe, you know, together we can show a way where we can make amends for that, where we can make up for that both together. I have my, my negativity that I have to make up for. You have yours to make up for. And maybe together we can, 
we can uh, help e we can help each other and help other beings to recognize the mistakes that are both being made. So 16 is if a person for whom you've cared for like your own child regards you as an enemy, cherish him specially like a mother does her child who is stricken with illness or sickness. This is the practice of the Bodhisattva. Even if a person for whom you've cared like your own child regards you as an enemy, cherish him specially like a mother does her child who is stricken with sickness. This is the practice of a Bodhisattva. So what this is saying is, if your child, if you're raising your child, and your child doesn't like you, because you've done good things for them, but for whatever reason, this child or this person that you've cared for, who you've regarded as a good friend, now regards you negatively, ne negativ neg negatively, that we should cherish that person like a mother who does a child who's diseased. If we look at these people as being sick, as we look at these people having an illness, if we look at these people as having uh, an injury or something, and this is why they are acting so negatively, what is their motivation? Why are they doing these things? Why is that person coming at me who wants to chop off my head? Why is that person who's coming and wants to steal my possessions? Why are they doing that? They are sick. What illness are they suffering from? They're suffering from the result of a bad action, a bad karma that they've taken. And can we forgive them? Can we help them as a mother would her own child who has done something like that? So this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to transpose ourselves from the being that we are to being another being, to being the mother of that child, the mother of that being who is doing these things. Would the mother forgive that child? Would the mother say, no, lock him up and throw away the key? You know, oh, no, this kid, this person, they, 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 in their heart, they're really a good person. I know they are, but they got mixed up with the wrong crowd at the wrong time in their lives, and they've been, you know, corrupted and influenced negatively and everything. And is there something that we can do to help um, educate, re-educate that person to, to bring them onto the path of, of wholesomeness and so on? Maybe this is what a mother would do, and this is what a bodhisattva would do, to help those beings as a, as a mother would help her child who's stricken with a disease, that we see these emotional diseases, we see the results of these things as an illness. <clears throat> Number 17, if an equal or inferior person disparages you out of pride, place them as you would your spiritual teacher with respect on the crown of your head. This is the practice of a bodhisattva. So again, this is the example that we were using, I think it was 14 and 15, where we were talking about where someone is slandering you, saying bad things about you, that you would put them on the crown of your head, that you would show them more respect than they've shown you, that we're not going to take the low road that they have done, Maybe they haven't realized what it is that they've done. Maybe it says an equal or inferior person disparages you. Maybe they didn't have the intellectual capability of recognizing the subtlety of what it was they were doing, the way they were slandering you or something. And, and, and maybe they were doing it, as it says here, disparage you out of pride, out of their pride that they were, they were being prideful that they recommended that. You know, some people like to point out other people's faults all the time. They take a lot of pride in that. Oh, Lance does this, Lance does that, you know, and, and, uh, and they're not shy about saying that in public places in front of people and so on. 
but we have to because it makes them feel you know really important that they recognize that and they have the power to bring that to other people's attention so it's out of their pride that they're doing that <clears throat> so again we need to place them on the crown of our head as if they are our teacher this is a practice of the bodhisattva to not allow ourselves to sink to the depths of what these um, people who do uh, disparaging things, say bad things, tell lies, and so on, or tell the truth that maybe uh, shouldn't have been told in a, in, a, in a particular way or something like that. So this is the practice of a bodhisattva. We can see that the bodhisattva is a very noble being, is a very pure being, and that when all these things are we're we're acting in the field this field of activity of impurity being a human being remember we're coming up out of the defilement of the ocean of samsara we're in the base of that of that water of that pond and we've talked about the seed of the the the, the lotus flower that that germinates in that muck in that mire and it and it grows, it begins to grow, and it breaks the surface of the water, and here comes this beautiful lotus flower. Well, the lotus flower is an example of the bodhisattva. It came from the, from the muck and mire. It came from the defilements. We all do. It's part of our human condition. The bodhisattva is a human being who is on the path to purify themselves. So we have to recognize that too. We have to recognize and take responsibility for that purity and the impurity from which we come. <clears throat> 18. Though you lack what you need and are constantly disparaged, afflicted by dangerous sickness and spirits, Without discouragement, take on the misdeeds and the pain of all living beings. That is the practice of the bodhisattva. I'll repeat that. Through, though you lack what you need and are constantly disparaged. So imagine that <clears throat> you're living a homeless life, that you're living on the streets, that you, you don't have the food that you need. You don't have the clothing you need. You don't have the health care you need. You don't have the shelter that you that you need. And you're constantly being disparaged by the police, by people coming down and, and kicking you and and uh, uh, taking what you little you have and doing terrible things and so on like that. that, that and so though you're constantly disparaged, that you're afflicted by dangerous sickness and spirits, that maybe you have these, you know, these emotional disorders, you know, maybe you need to be, you know, at least institutionalized for a period of time and get the right medicines to help you, whether it's a physical illness or it's an intellectual illness or whatever, that you need these, but you're, you're not getting that kind of attention. You're afflicted by these things. But without discouragement, Take on the deeds, the misdeeds, and the pain of all living beings. Though you lack this, though you do this, though you're you're subject to all this uh, all this um, um, negativity, that you still work for the benefit of other beings. That you take on the misdeeds and the pain of all living beings. This is the practice of a bodhisattva. To put it in another way, that there are people on the street who are in those situations, and they become heroes to many of those other street people. They become the ones who are helping those beings just like them. They're the ones who are taking them to the shelters. They're the ones who, who they will give their shelter space to, to someone else who is in worse condition than they are. And that person then becomes, is behaving like a, Bodhisattva. They may not have a home, they may not have clothes, they may not have the food and so on like that, but they're behaving like a Bodhisattva. 
So we have to recognize that bodhisattvas come in many different forms. Bodhisattvas don't have to be wearing jewels. Very bodhisattvas don't have to be driving, you know, very big important cars and living in important homes and and having respect and so on like that. They can be very low life people who are doing very high life things for other people, have great compassion and great loving kindness for the sake of other beings who are suffering more than they are. So the 19, though you become famous and may and many bow to you and you gain riches equal to Vajrava's See that the holy say that the worldly fortune is without essence and be unconceited. This is the practice of the bodhisattvas. Say it again. Though you become famous and many bow to you, so many people know you, many people have respect for you, maybe you're a political leader, maybe you're a doctor or a lawyer, maybe you have a lot of money, maybe you have um great skill in being a teacher many different things you become famous and many people bow to you and you gain riches equal to vajrava vajrava is the uh the god of wealth they talk about the god of wealth who sits at one point of the uh of the of, of, of mount meru and um and has all these riches and everything and is is able to bring all these things together and use all these things for the benefit of all, all beings and so on. So though you have all the riches, though you have all the benefit of Vajrava, this God of wealth, to see that worldly fortune is without essence. For us to recognize that all that fortune that Vajrava has is all emptiness, is all temporary, is all just stuff of this world, of this phenomenal world. It has no no pure essence of itself. It's all composite stuff that's made up of many other things. This worldly fortune is without essence and be unconceited that though we may have all this, that we need to recognize that it is empty of its own nature and there's nothing to be conceited about. There's nothing to be prideful about and to maybe use these things for the benefit of others, to share the wealth that we have with other beings, to be generous. So this is the practice of the bodhisattva. So here's the case of of a being who is like a god, has all the wealth one can imagine, but yet is using it to help other beings. Maybe it's medical things, maybe it's building hospitals, maybe it's building schools, maybe it's going to other parts of the world where where people are uh, are in need of, of greater support and, and helping them and so on. To do those things is Bodhisattva's work. And not just taking these things and and sitting and 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 counting their money in their treasury room and just looking at their their piles of treasure that they have accumulated over their many years and lifetimes and so on, that they're sharing it, that they're doing it for the benefit of others. This is the practice of a bodhisattva. Any questions or comments about this, about material wealth, the lack of material wealth, the presence of material wealth, helping other people, although, you know, whatever it is that you have, sharing with other people. Is this inspirational to you in some way? Does this, you know, spark something in your in your heart mind that says, oh, yeah, you know, I, I've tried to do this, or maybe I do this, or maybe I need to do this more, or something like that? For me, this is like so, I mean, I have the book and I've read it, listening to you describe and go through different examples of application and more in depth with the concepts is just really, really lovely and and helps. It's making me even, you know, think a little bit more about my day-to-day behaviors with people. Um, 
and and you said something lance that was profound for me and I, I appreciate everyone's patience as i'm like i have all these light bulbs you said the bodhisattva like you wake up and you're thinking about these things like that is your purpose versus it's incidental and accidental and that is something i believe i'm sort of half in and half out because i'm so distracted by the bullshit of day-to-day -day stuff that i have to deal with that i get um easy, you know not easily angered as i used to however what you just said was profound and like now i have sort of a compass and a direction and a map more of a map and when i wake up and this is my focus and purpose then i know i've made another sort of transcendent sort of for me as like if i'm progress monitoring that would be like my thing I'm like okay now i'm starting to shift even more at a spiritual level so thank you you're welcome thank you for that and and this is a meditation this is a contemplation you know these little books you know i got this little book here that has everything that we're reading here on the screen is in this book so you can print what's on the screen but my point is this can be a, a series of meditations for you you say okay i'm going to do my opening prayers i'm going to set my motivation and this is what i'm going to contemplate for this particular practice and I, you can only get through so much in a given time. So maybe it becomes, well, I'm going to do this this whole week. I'm going to go through this whole book in the week. So I'm going to split it up in, in sections. And I'm going to do the first 10 the first day, and maybe the next five the next day, or something like that. My point is, it's not something that we read one time and put down. It's something that we have to read many times and contemplate over and over again the circle the cycle the wheel of 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 the dharma that's why we call it the dharma wheel because it keeps going around it just doesn't go around one time and stop it keeps going around because we look at it in different ways we have more experience with it and it changes as we change so we need to look at that and we recognize that it's like a spiral it, it rises up and it gets finer and finer until we get to the very tip. And the very tip is is that point of, of, of being a bodhisattva who is then becoming a Buddha. A human being who is a bodhisattva who then becomes perfectly realized as a Buddha. Uncorrupted, perfectly pure in every way, shape, or form. <clears throat> okay. So then we continue. Does anybody want to take a break? Do you need to stand up and uh, have a drink or take a stretch or something like that? Okay. Well, then we'll continue. Number 20. While the enemy of your own anger is not subdued, Though you conquer external forces, external foes, they will only increase. Therefore, with the militia of love and compassion, subdue your own mind. This is the practice of the Bodhisattva. Read it again. While the enemy of your own anger is not subdued. So the enemy of our own anger. Who is the enemy of our anger? You know, who are we foisting our our anger the 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 enemy of our anger that our anger is the enemy is not subdued we're not subduing that anger the causes of the anger though you conquer external foes though stuff around us has become maybe a little bit more settled it's still within us all this increases all this only increases because we haven't settled the root cause, which is our own anger. And that way, everything is going to irritate us. Everything is going to be an aggravation to us because we haven't settled our own anger, our own confusion, our own ignorance of what is going on. So, all, so everything that we see is just going to be more source of more problems more anger therefore 
with the militia of love. So here it's using this in, in, in like military terms, the enemy of our anger. Here's the enemy. Here is the militia of love. Here comes the warriors. Here come the, you know, the, 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 the guys on the, the white horses who are coming to save the day. You know, the militia of love and compassion, the warriors of love and compassion, subdue your own mind. And we're talking about the emotional, afflictive emotion mind. We're talking about the intellectual mind. We're not talking about the big mind. That's already pure. That's our Buddha nature. But it's this mind. And then what we need to do is to be able to settle this mind and then this mind and the big mind we see is all one mind. But this mind is blocking up this mind. So we can't even approach this mind until we can clear away those blockages. We can clear away the anger, the, uh, the, um, the, the ignorance, clear away the desires and the jealousy and the, and the greediness and so on. So we do that with the militia of love and compassion to subdue our mind. So what is the love and compassion is the bodhicitta. And when we we're talking about developing our daily practice and we talk about the stages of meditation and we talk about, well, what is the method to, to approach the stages of the meditation? The method begins with loving kindness the four kindnesses of the mother. And then it continues with the compassion, the this visualizing the mother in the six realms of suffering, the six realms of samsara becomes motivation for the compassion for us. So this is, we can see that the practices that we've been developing are directly connected to what these teachings of the practices of the bodhisattva are. This is how we get to be a bodhisattva. Therefore, the militia of love and compassion subdue your own mind, your intellectual mind. This is the practice of the bodhisattva. The bodhisattva has to start somewhere. It starts in the defiled bottom of the ocean of suffering. But then slowly, slowly, it starts working its way up and it starts purifying and getting getting closer to, to the pure virtue that we wish to be at. So this is the work of the Bodhisattva. So now number 21. Sensual pleasures are like salt water. The more you indulge, the more thirst increases. Abandon at once those things which breed clinging attachment. This is the practice of the bodhisattva. So sensual pleasures are like salt water. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about the 12 links of interdependent origination. And we, we focused on, um, I forget if it was maybe number seven uh, of the, the seven links, was the pleasures, it, it showed a, a, a man who was drunk and who kept drinking because he could never satisfy his, his thirst for the alcohol, for the intoxicant. He always wanted more. So sensual pleasures are like that. We never get satisfied. We want more and more and more. It's like salt water. You cannot drink salt water and quench your thirst. The more you indulge, the more the thirst increases for this. So abandon at once those things which breed clinging attachment. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. So recognize that we have grasping, that we're grasping for this life. We wanted this life. When we get to talk about the Bardo Todal, we'll, we'll talk a lot more about that, about what it is, how it is that we have been born over and over and over again. <clears throat> how we've died over and over and over again. Not as Lance or as Kate or as Zara, but as human beings. You know, that we've been on this continuum of things that have been happening and so on. What is, why have we been grasping at a body? Why have we been grasping at this life and so on? So we need to understand that. Then we need to understand the craving that we have for that. 
the craving that we're sitting there stewing saying, oh, I got to have this body. Oh, I got to have this house. Oh, I got to have this money in the bank account. Oh, I got to have this power to do these things. I'm craving all the, all the different things that go along with this life. And I'm just sitting there craving this. And then once you get it, you cling on to it. I'm not going to let it go. I'm going to lock it up. I'm going to put it in a box. I'm going to put it in a put it in a treasure chest. I'm going to put it in the bank. I'm never going to take it out. I'm going to take as much as I can, and I'm not going to share it with anybody. So recognizing these things, bringing this to light, to educate ourselves about this, is to bring light to the darkness of ignorance. And that process is the bodhisattva process to go through and see all these little subtle things that we do that contribute to our corruptions, that can contribute to our, excuse me, being born over and over again. Now, we need to look at this, at this point in our lives, with this Dharma experience that we're having, we need to be able to look at this for the benefit of other beings, that we're doing this now for the benefit of other beings. And that, and that yes, I may have some, 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 um, some things to pay for. I may have to make some atonement for some misdeeds that I've done. And I will do that with courage. I will do that with, with a, a, um, a, an honor saying, okay, I've, I've done some bad things and I got to make up for those things and I'll, I'll come back as often as I can, as often as I need to, to make up for those things. But the way in which I do that is by helping other people now. Wherever I have opportunity to help other beings, I do that now. I don't put that off. I find ways to do it. I look for ways to do it. So this is the practice of the Bodhisattva. Twenty-two. Whatever appears is your own mind. Your mind from the start was free from fabricated extremes. Understanding this, do not take to mind inherent signs of subject and object. This is the practice of the bodhisattvas. So this is kind of subtle. Now think about this a little bit. Whatever appears is your own mind. All this appears, just our mind is like the camera, that, that all this input is coming in through our eyes, coming in through our ears, through our nose, through our mouth, through our touch. All this stuff is coming into that. And it's our mind, our, our little mind, our, our brain, that is processing all this. If, if, if we didn't have the mind, it would be like an empty camera with no film in it or no memory stick or something like that. It would see the objects, but it wouldn't know how to process them. It doesn't mean anything to it. But we have the ability to be do, doing that. And so everything that we see then, we're processing, we're putting all these ideas together. So this whole phenomenal nature is an appearance to our mind. This whole relative nature, this relative truth is appearance to our mind. And our mind is another concept in which to be able to understand that. The camera, the example of a camera, is a concept to help us to understand that in a very simple way. But the mind is like that camera. And the mind is just another figment of our imagination that we use to be able to communicate to ourselves and to each other about this phenomenal nature, this phenomenal mind. All this is the appearance of the, of the mind. We have conventions where we agree on things. Oh, this is the color blue. This is the color red. This is a tree. 
this is grass, this is a house, this is a car, all these different things. We agree on the names of all these things and what they look like and so on, what they sound like, what they taste like, what they feel like, etc. We agree on those things, but they're all temporary. They're all compounded things. They, they're on their own, they do not exist. So whatever appears is our own mind. Your mind from the start was free from fabricated extremes. Your mind from the start was free from fabricated extremes. So where's the start? Do we look at the start of being a human being? Of being an infant that is just born? Is that, is that human being, is that infant free from fabricated extremes? Is it free of the mind? Is the mind, is that camera not able to focus anything, not able to recognize anything? It hasn't been developed yet. Is that mind, that brain in that situation like that? There's a, an analogy there to use the infant as an analogy. It's a very practical uh, analogy because that's what we go through. But there's another more profound, more subtle way of looking at this because we talk about the two truths. We talk about the relative truth, which is this phenomenal nature and all of its myriad forms and and compositions and so on. There's the relative truth, but then there is the absolute truth. And the absolute truth is like space. There's no way to define it. There's no way to understand it as a human being. There may be other ways of looking at both of these things, by transcending becoming a human being. And we may think of our Buddha nature as being a gateway, a doorway to, that, to those other dimensions, to those other ways of looking at things that are only can be experienced as a human being. We can't fathom what it is but we can experience it and we come back and we say oh i had the experience of love i've had the experience of bodhicitta that's how we look at it so that absolute nature is free from fabricated extremes all the fabricated extremes are in the relative that's in the mind but this space, this absolute, is indescribable beyond that. The mind cannot conceive of it. The mind cannot describe it. The mind can experience it, but there's no words for it. There's no, it has to be experienced. So understanding this, do not take to mind the inherent sign. Do not take to mind the inherent signs of subject and object. The inherent signs of subject and of object is the essence of the duality, our dualistic nature, what it is to be a human being, that we go through this dualism. And that's what this phenomenal nature is all part of, the myriad ways in which this dualism displays itself. It displays itself. So another, this is a coarse analogy, you know, but if you had a, you've all been to the movies and maybe you've had a movie projector at home, you know, when we were kids or something like that, and you had the movie projector, you had a light bulb in it and the movie projector would turn the gears around and there was a film and the film would, would, the, would project the image up on the screen. So all this is like the mind, the fabricated mind. This, so the, the image that is being projected is 
the image that was imprinted on the film. So in this case, this example, the film is like the is like the space. Or you could say that the film is is like the memory and the space is in between the film itself, the lens and the screen where the display takes place. So maybe the space is there because there's light going through that space. It's lighting that up. So there's all different kinds of ways to think about this. It's a course, it's a course analogy. But the point is, is that in this indescribable space is this display of that, that we as human beings can recognize. And what we're learning to recognize it as is spirituality, as well as the physicality that we've been doing all our lifetime and the intellectualism conventions that we have assigned to all these things, all the names that we've given to all these things, that in addition to those two things, there is the spirituality. And that's what leads us to be able to, to recognize or to experience, to recognize the experience, the realization of that true nature. So understanding this, do not take to mind inherent signs of subject on object. This is the practice of the Bodhisattva. So we have to start looking at things as this fabrication. We have to start looking at things as this display, like a mirage. All this is a figment of our imagination, of our mind. And that might be difficult to, 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 to accept. Especially, I, I was going to say something. I'm sorry. That's all right. Go I, ahead. Think, I think that it begins even in uh, while mo the mother is pregnant with us and what they visualize. And if that sends the cortisone or the stress hormone into the infant developing, um, that could lead into a dualistic projection after the uh, child is born. So, so that child starts reflecting um, some of or aligning with certain worldly issues that occur. Uh, and it's all just a projection of the mind. I, maybe, I've so. Been, I'd be, maybe so. I have an example of this, but I don't want to go too long. We can go to 24. No, so, uh, so you get the point that, that your example is a physical example. You're making a physical example of that. You know, it's being transmitted through the blood or maybe it's transmitted through the, the, the neurons of the mother being connected to the infant and, you know, who's still inside the mother or something like that. It's physically being transmitted. So it's all, it's all possible. This is the practice of the Bodhisattva to be able to look at all these things. Maybe we don't need to look at these things. We say, you know what? I don't need all this stuff. Lance, why are you talking about this? This just gives me a headache. Can't we just say some devotional prayers and get on with it? And that's, that's healthy. That's okay. And, you know, but, but we're talking about the science of the spirituality as we know it, the Buddhism, this is what we're here to talk about. But if we say, I don't need to do these, I can do devotional prayers and I can do devotional practices and be very happy, then that's what you should do. Not everybody has to do this. And it doesn't have to be Buddhism. It could be, it could be Christianity. It could be Muslim. It could be Hinduism. It could be humanism. It could be Taoism. It could be any of these things. It's just a, a system by which we are analyzing how it is that human beings work with a spiritual component. Some scientists might say, oh, well, you know, that spirituality doesn't exist because I can't measure it, I can't weigh it, and so on. That's just wistful thinking. Okay, maybe so.
Okay. So then we go to 23. When you encounter attractive obje objects, when you encounter attractive objects, though they seem beautiful, like a rainbow in summer, don't regard them as real and give up attachment. This is the practice of the Bodhisattva. So when you see things that you like, attractive objects, jewels, clothing, whatever, though they seem beautiful like a rainbow in summer, a rainbow in summer is an illusion. You know, it's, it's, it's just the moisture up in the atmosphere, and when the sun hits it in a certain way, it kind of turns on this rainbow effect. But it's not a solid. It may appear to be a solid, but it's just an illusion. So these attractive objects, they're just objects of phenomenal nature. And they themselves are illusions. They're made up of, of different materials that all get subjected down to or get reduced down to atoms and, 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 um, and subatomic particles and the energy that binds them together and pulls them apart and so on. So it all gets down to that that all of this is all empty of its own true nature. So we regard them as, we don't regard them as being real, as being temporary, as being empty of their own nature. And therefore, we give up all attachment to these things. Why attach ourselves to something that is temporary? This is the practice of the Bodhisattva. So we'll do this last one, number 24, and then we'll stop for the evening. All forms of suffering are like a child's death in a dream. Holding illusory appearances to be true makes you weary. Therefore, when you meet with disagreeable circumstances, see them as illusory. This is the practice of the Bodhisattva. Again, all forms of suffering are like a child's death in a dream. Holding illusory appearances to be true makes you weary. So all this suffering that we have is illusory. We've created this out of our afflictive emotions. I can't hand you some hatred. I can't hand you some fear. I can't hand you some ignorance. It, it, it's, it's just a mental affliction. And the mental is temporary. It, it, it's the brain. And, and the brain is just part of the body. It's all temporary. All this suffering is illusory, just as all these appearances are illusory. So it's like a, the, 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 a child's death in a dream. I guess they use this because it's such a shocking um, example. You know, when we, if we, when we have a, a dream like that, maybe we call it a nightmare or a strong dream or something, but we wake up with a start. We wake up and maybe we're screaming out loud or something or, or we're thrashing about in our bed because it seems so real to us. But that's, but it's just an illusion. It's like a dream. All this is like a dream. All this is like an illusion. Where were you at six o'clock tonight? Think about where you were at six o'clock tonight. It's just like a dream now, isn't it? It's just like an illusion. And where we are right now, in just a moment, is going to be another dream. So we go through life through these illusions all the time. And if we think that these illusions are real, that's when we start having a lot of problems. This is how we're able, as, as buddy sattvas, to be able to give this up, to be able to liberate ourselves from the illusion that this life is real. This, this makes me think of Einstein and his theory of relativity and how many other scientists disagree with it, but um, our current civilization allows Einstein's 
theory to be what holds us all together. Like it must be taught, you know, but there's other scientists who disproved him. And it's all an illusion. No, it's all some point of view. So, um, so this just makes you weary, you know, this, and, and the, the liberation comes from when we exhaust all these possibilities and saying, oh, I can't deal with this anymore. I just want to relax. Therefore, when you meet with disagreeable circumstances, see them as illusory. This is the practice of the Bodhisattva disagreeable circumstances but you can also say that when we meet with happy circumstances things that we like that can turn on a dime to become disagreeable circumstances i got my brand new car i'm driving my brand new car down the road and i'm feeling so wonderful i'm so happy boy it's great and I put the top down on the convertible and everything, and I'm cruising along and having a good time. And somebody comes through a stop sign and T-bones my car. And now that happiness just turns into a very disagreeable circumstance. So even though we have this brand new car and we're driving and we're all happy and prideful about it, we have to remember it's only temporary too. So we have to, we have to uh, train ourselves to recognize the illusory nature of phenomenal existence. And when we do, we find that is what is natural. That all these fabrications that we make, all these conventions that we create are what's confusing us they become the defilements that fall from the ocean of suffering fall to the bottom and all this decay starts happening because all these things are just falling there and just becomes mud and disease and and the food for for more confusion so by allowing ourselves to liberate, allowing ourselves to relax, or allowing ourselves to be in samadhi. Samadhi is that state of meditation where there's no expectations, there's no fear, there's no confusion, there's no emotions. It's the bodhisattva mind. So this is the practice of the Bodhisattvas. So for tonight, we'll leave it here on 24. We'll come back next week and talk about 25. We'll pick it up. And we got 37 to talk about. And they, they get a little bit more uh, subtle as we progress along. So I hope this has been helpful. Yes, it has. Uh, I've been through them before, like like Zara, but it it's been a while, and it's good to revisit them and and dig into them in a little more depth with examples. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I've appreciated hearing everyone's thoughts on this. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else have any comments you want to talk about? I appreciate it, and uh, still the, those difficult ones are, they're really hard to get through, but the head cutter, if they're coming to take your head, and um, people stealing your stuff, but I can, I can think um, and apply uh, forgiveness and, and even more in-depth learning on how to get to that state of forgiveness. Uh -huh. It reminds me of that Hawaiian prayer, the Oho Oponopono, where um, when the uh, 
the sociologist or the psychologist who was at the psych ward began doing the ho'oponopono to all the those inside the ward, um, within months they were all released and they, they all became sane. Uh, well, I don't know anything about that, but it sounds very interesting. I, I, um, Gavin, I know about this one. I listened to I listened to it on YouTube. It's very peaceful. Yeah. yeah. And the whole uh, practice, you know, it came from a psychologist who was counseling people in Hawaii at the mental ward. And uh, the experience is uh, enlightening, just like these, you know, that I could do ho'oponopono to people who would cause me uh, mental harm and try to, you know, see them release that entanglement upon me and then be freed. Okay. Um, I'll share a little something and I'll try to keep it short. Um, yeah, sorry, my Zoom crashed earlier, but um, yeah, thanks for ending with the illusions, Lance, too. That was a great ending. Um, so I've actually hit and killed a pedestrian. It's been a few years, but um, I didn't do anything wrong. Uh, my karma is good with that, but it's still, it just feels horrible. So I don't wish that I'm part of anybody. Um, and uh, now my mom just got her fourth DUI. And I keep telling her, like, I didn't do anything wrong. Like, how are you going to feel if, you know, you're doing it intentionally? Um, uh, but yeah, and I've been, I've been supporting her for years. And as hard as it is, like, I'm walking away. I'm not enabling this anymore. And um, yeah, I took refuge with his Emerson's uh Garch and Rinpoche and I read the little yellow book every day and I really appreciate you saying that Lance that like you got to use your logic too um you know because yeah today's world is different than when this was written but yeah I just have to finally listen to my heart and walk away like you said some selfish people will just take and take and take and yeah, sorry I'm emotional, but it's, it's just such a hard subject for me. But I'm glad that you guys give these resources and I have that little book. I always have it on me <laughs> to read. Um, and Gavin, I would love to hear the um, the Einstein disproving stuff too. That was really interesting. And yeah, just thanks everybody. Good class. Can I, can I say something real quick? Sure. So, um, thanks. I, I appreciate you sharing that and Gavin what you had shared earlier as well um about your experience and and I think you know I, and I'm not like giving like advice or something of what you should do or not of course but I think with these things too I think we can take it like in a very naive way of like what it means to be like a bodhisattva or to be helping someone and it's like with something like this I work a lot with um you know with people with addictions and I've had certain addictions and stuff myself in my life but um like something like, well, like, well, it seems like a bodhisattva thing to be like giving somebody money then or like doing these other things where it's like, is this, a but you could be doing things that are actually harming someone. I'm not saying you're doing things that are harming someone, but just making the point of like guilt of like, oh, well, if I'm pulling away from someone or I'm doing something with it, and that means like I'm doing something wrong when sometimes things that on the surface, you know, might seem not as like kind or the person might not like as much in the moment can be the more compassionate thing to do at times or the more loving thing to do or things like that. I don't know how relevant that is to what you're saying. Very relevant. Yeah, thanks. I think that's what I'm finally starting to get. Um, yeah, I think it would be the most compassionate thing to let her figure it out. Thanks a lot. Thank you for sharing that. And, and that's why we're all together. I mean, this is what Sangha is about. You know, we're brothers and sisters and we're here to support each other, to guide each other in, in many different ways and so on. And uh, so so this is a healthy way in which to do this. And, and sometimes, you know, we talk a lot about these things and sometimes it's just giving everybody space to be able to think about these things and, and let these things, you know, I could just read these things without any personal notes about them and anything, and it would just go through very fast. But when you're just kind of talking about your own personal experiences, it gives people time to be thinking about it on their own. 
So it's part of the process. So I, I thank you all for having the patience for that and allowing these these things that have been either suppressed or 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 you want to suppress them or allow them to come up. You know, we talk about karma coming to fruition. If we keep if I was just, I was just gonna ask you about that. Um that you said that Emanuela couldn't Lance, couldn't this be the ending of something from her previous that she's done and this is the sign of something positive to come for her? Like meaning like like for me when I was scammed, like my cousin knows and you know oh, three hundred fifty thousand dollars I was defrauded in a cryptocurrency scam. Um and I was it was horrible. Um, Lance knew me at that time and my faith and spirituality, I realized this is my negative karma from something I've done. And this is an opportunity for growth and positive things to come. Is that a way to reframe or to have a perspective of growth? Like in some of the things people have just shared tonight? Sure, I think so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we're, we're all, you know, living the results of our karma. Thanks. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, it's actually really beautiful. Uh, it's like all my good karma is coming back and helping me a lot now that I didn't even know I had. And yeah, that's been really beautiful too. Yeah, I mean, go ahead, it, sorry. It, for me, like, I don't know, this is just because of, I don't know, like, and I apologize, I don't know how the right way to say this. Now that when I when I see the things that we call bad, like Lance, like they're illusionary to an extent that I feel as bad as a human, I'm like, oh, thank you. Like, I'm actually grateful for it. I, I Like for me, I'm like, this is a blessing. Thank you for, you know, this person or I'm actually my mindset is like of, of complete gratitude. I'm like, this is wonderful for this opportunity and I'm going to grow from this and become a better spiritual practitioner. Um, that's how I see it. I don't, Lance, is that, is that a, is that the shift you would expect as we're going through these painful, these like Emmanuel, that's such a, Emmanuel, that's a painful thing. What happened with me was painful, Gavin, and each of us has something that was so painful in our journey. Is that the evolution though? Is that part of the path when you start, your mind starts shifting and naturally you're like, okay, this is a good thing for me. I see this as a positive um, and I don't see it as pain. Is that yeah. something that would happen? Yeah, it's another it's another step along the path, the path of enlightenment, of seeing all these things, but seeing them as illusory, you know, seeing all this thing as something that we've created for ourselves. We're the architect who designed this life that we have, and now we're the engineers who are having to navigate all this. But, you know, we want to be the engineer who is a bodhisattva. We want to be the uh, the architect who is a bodhisattva. Ultimately, we become a Buddha. Ultimately, we have Buddha nature within ourselves. And it's the qualities of that, what we call Buddha, the awakened one, who is realizing all this. So we don't have to die. We don't have to give up this body to recognize, to realize that. You know, we've got this ability right now. And that's this gift that we have of this life. That's the, the gift of the, of the Sangha to help us to realize that. It's the gift of the Dharma, the teachings, the scriptures, all these books to help us to uh, to to support that and so on. So, yes, all this is all working together. Thank you. Thank you for everyone for sharing as well. Um, some of these things that appear to be painful and they are like they very rightfully are. They feel crappy and shitty. And, and thank you all for being so vulnerable. I, I appreciate um, everyone's. But I would hope that they would be like lifting a bag off your back, you know, a bag of dead weight, you know, that you're, you're, you're putting down, you know, you're letting it come up to fruition. It sees the light of the truth. And now you're able to just let it go. <clears throat> yeah, exactly, Lance. Thanks for the safe space, everybody. You're welcome. That's a good it way to explain it, makes, safe space. It makes me think too, this, um, just real quick, like even just helping with like um like patience and compassion and things as well and it's something that's been like a blessing with the kind of work i do too because you like hear what's actually going on with people even people who seem like their life is like oh this is the perfect life that everyone wants or something but i'm just like the amount of suffering that everyone goes through 
and it's like everyone's got their shit you know like their traumas their like things it's like once like you actually start talking to people and yeah i think it can help have more patience and compassion with people and stuff too where it's like we're all we're all the walking wounded uh all of us being like the human race or everything that's we're all right. we're all limping our way through trying to figure it out that's right that uh realization was the buddha's first step towards enlightenment right when he left uh left his father's palace the realization uh, of, of the realization of, of, of samsara of the suffering of others that how hard life is yes that was his motivation yes that was his motivation was to understand the suffering of others you know and to to recognize that and then that that became the four noble truths yes <clears throat> I, I was thinking a lot uh during our time today uh about uh what kate had said regarding a few of the uh what we just studied and well you know if someone's coming to chop your head off or if they're coming you know you've got to protect your family you've got to protect yourself as a means to protect your family but on the other side you know this is all illusory so is any of this all really that important and i was thinking about something that happened to me at work a few weeks ago that was very scary uh and if it, if it had been a different ceo i probably would have been fired uh, but we have a good ceo so i wasn't fired uh but i won't get into a lot of details but one of those situations where i don't really have blame but i have responsibility and so it, it was a bad situation and scary and i'm thinking wow you know uh, on one hand i should just be like hey it doesn't really matter but on the other hand to case point you know i've got mouths to feed and i've got children dependent on me and they need a place to live um and, and it just so i'm trying to balance these two out these two competing ideas but it remind you know i have this vision of someday escaping the rat race and just you know living in a beach house and meditating every day and reading reading all these books and just escaping uh, you know but there was this uh fellow uh, very wealthy ceo who retired and he said well i'm just going to go leave the business world and retire to the beach and this woman tweeted who had a buddhist background and she said you know what if you don't figure out the secret of a calm mind the beach will swallow you up it won't be fun you know if you don't learn to be calm uh, and so it's kind of like this right now where we are, this is where we learn calm mind. This is where we learn, because if you can't be calm mind, calm now, you, you can't be calm in retirement. Uh, so it's just, that's what's been going through my head. I don't know if that's helpful. Or not. No, I think that's right on. Thank you very much for that. Yes. All right. Does anybody else have a comment you'd like to make before we... Uh... Do our dedication prayers. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate Thank all you your talking. Um, to Emmanuel, I just want to say there's a physicist, Thomas Townsend Brown, if you want to look up him uh, to explain a little bit more about extra relativity. Uh, I appreciate everybody tonight and everything we've said. It's been a great night. Okay, very good. Thank you too. Thanks, Gavin. Yeah, I'll look it up. Sorry, Thomas. Uh, what was the rest? Thomas Townsend Brown. Townsend Brown. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks he uh, he was sponsored by the government to um, test uh, like time travel, and what he discovered has really been written into obscurity. So really, people can't know. It's almost as if he doesn't even exist, but. Um, there's a lot that was discovered. <laughs> Thanks, yeah, I believe it. Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, Brendan is umze this evening. So Brendan, would you uh, re recite the dedication prayers, lead us in the dedication prayers. Everybody should recite uh, out loud as well uh, with your microphones muted and uh, if you'll begin on page 18 and continue through to page uh, 22, please. Lineage Dedication Prayer.
George Chang, Talopa, Theropa, Marpa, Melarepa, Dharma Lord Gampopa, Pagmodrupa, and Lord Dringupa, please bestow upon us the most auspicious blessing of all the Kagulamas. By this virtue, may I achieve the all knowing state, and may all who travel on the waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death cross the ocean of samsara by defeating all enemies, confusion, the cause of suffering. Bodhicitta, the excellent and precious mind, where it is unborn may it arise, where it is born may it not decline, but ever increase higher and higher. I pray that the Lama may have good health. I pray that the Lama may have long life. I pray that your Dharma activities spread far and wide. I pray that I may not be separated from you. As Manjushri the warrior realized the ultimate state, and as did Samathabhatra, I will follow on their path and fully dedicate get all the merit for all sentient beings. By the blessing of the Buddha who attained the three, three kayas, by the blessing of the truth of the unchanging Dharma as such, by the blessing of the indivisible Sangha order, may the merit I share bear fruit. The Korma prayer, by the virtues collected in the three times by myself and all beings in samsara and nirvana and by the innate root of virtue may i and all sentient beings quickly attain unsurpassed perfect complete and precious enlightenment may the teachings of the great Rinkupa, Rat ratnashari who is omniscient lord of the dharma master of interdependence continue and increase through study practice contemplation and meditation until the end of samsara. Dedication prayer by Lord Jinkan Sungun. Glorious, holy, venerable, precious, kind root and lineage lamas, divine assembly of Yirams and assemblies of Buddhas, bodhisattvas, yogins, yoginis, and dakinis dwelling in the ten directions, please hear my prayer. May the virtues collected in the three times by myself and all sentient beings in samsara and nirvana and the innate root of virtue not result in the eight worldly concerns, the four causes of samsara, or rebirth as a shravaka, or pratya buddha. May all other sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me and mine, obstructors who harm, misleading maras, and the hordes of demons, experience happiness, be separated from suffering, and swiftly attain unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious buddhahood. By the power of this vast root of virtue, may I benefit all beings, through my body, speech, and mind. May the afflictions of desire, hatred, ignorance, arrogance, and jealousy not arise in my mind. May attachment to fame, reputation, wealth, honor, and concern for this life not arise for even a moment. May my mind stream be moistened by loving kindness, compassion, and bodhicitta. And through that, may I become a spiritual master with good qualities equal to the infinity of space. May I gain the supreme attainment, attainment of Mahamudra in this very life. May the torment of suffering not arise even at the time of my death. May I not die with negative thoughts. May I not die confused by a wrong view. May I not experience the velocity of the mind as such and the pervading clarity of Dharmata. May I, in any case, gain the supreme attainment of Mahamudra at the time of death or in the bardo. Purification practice, om, ah, ah, om, om, ah, om, om, ah, om. May my body, speech, and mind. Become inseparable from the body, speech, speech, and mind, and mind of all the enlightened ones for the benefit of all sentient beings. Thank you, Lance. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Brendan. Thank you all for all your comments and your patience and your participation. Thank you very much. Emanuela, if you want um, 
message me on on WhatsApp if you if you're interested in like talking about if you're looking for some pointers and stuff and resources for the the situation you were talking about with your mom. Uh, you know, please let me know. So much, yeah. Thanks. Good to know you're a professional too. Um, and yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. I hope everyone has a great night and great class. Thanks, man. All right. So and just Manuela? a reminder. I'm sorry. Go, uh, what were you gonna say, Kate? I was gonna ask Emanuela, is it okay if I pray for you and your mother? Oh, please. Thank you so much. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank of course. you. Okay. Um, so um, this week is the Manny Drupshin at Dharma Surya, uh, Jikung Dharma Surya Center. I sent everybody the flyer for that. And uh, so that's going to start on Thursday, 9 o'clock in the morning Eastern time and continue to 5 o'clock in the afternoon, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday and Sunday. So this is a, a rare opportunity. It happens once a year to be able to participate in this. So if you can do it all, if you can do it one day, if you can do it for an hour, whatever you can, you can come in and go out, whatever is really helpful. And we can talk about the significance of this uh, later on. Or if you want to text me while we're watching this, I'll be on Zoom as well. So uh, I'll be more than glad to uh, answer whatever questions I can for you. So therefore, on Thursday night, we will not have Medicine Buddha. And on Sunday, we will not have our Buddhism workshop, our 201 uh, class this Sunday. But we will resume our normal schedule the following week with uh, Monday night when we do our Buddhism 101 here like this. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, I will send you the Zoom link for the uh, weekend as soon as I get it. I'll send it in the WhatsApp, so uh, make it easy for you to uh, join the group. Thank you all. Thanks, Lance. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Good night, all. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Prosper and love and wellness, kindness and joy. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Katie. I'll uh, I'll look for that document tonight.